Hello everyone and welcome uh, to a special episode of GeoAwesome Talk. Um, I have here with me Peter, the Chief Product Officer at Venter. Peter and I wanted to chat about the recent rebranding of Maxar into Venter and what this means for the product vision, what this means for the technology and in general where he thinks the company is headed. So Peter, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Uh, so I joined Maxar, now Vantor, about a year and a half ago, and the rebrand has been really the culmination of that journey, sort of joining the company, getting to know the people, the technology, the customers, and trying to think about how we can sort of best position ourselves to grow bigger, to grow and to play a much more central role in the overall spatial intelligence cycle. Thanks. Um, it's it's great to have you, and it's you've kind of grown right into it. Um, but before we discuss all the other details of what this means for the product teams and so on, why Venter? Why this particular name? What does it even mean? Yeah, so Vantor is a reimagination of a company that's gone through a number of different names in the past 10 and 15 years. Really, a lot of people may know it as Digital Globe, uh, merged with GOI, became Maxar, bought Frycon. So the company's gone through a, a long journey of evolving both our capabilities and our brand and recognition in the market. And with Vantor, we really wanted to take that 15 years and checkpoint and say, what are we doing today and what are we doing moving forward? And the real focus with the rebrand was creating an opportunity to catalyze conversations with our customers about the capabilities that we had developed over the last 10, 15 years, but maybe hadn't talked as publicly with them about. Um, things like geospatial software that builds on top of the data, ability to orchestrate sovereign assets and multi-source constellation collection. Uh, you know, We've really sort of tried to take the company and compress all of the technology that we've developed in many different pockets of the organization over time into a really cohesive and simple vision for customers to latch onto um, and also for employees to understand. So when we think about Vantor, perhaps the most important thing that we're really focused on is end-to-end -end spatial intelligence. So not just providing data, but also adding artificial intelligence to the entire tasking, collection, production, exploitation, dissemination loop, that classic TCPED cycle, we want to be applying intelligence to each part of that. We, let's get into um, AI and, and the product vision in just a second. And Digital Globe um, and the whole history of Maxar is a very important one. And for somebody like me, who's been following uh, the geospatial sector for close to two decades now, it's an iconic company. It's underwent a lot of changes, not just in its branding, but also in its ownership structure. How do you see that? Is Ventura now, like you saw, said, a starting point for a new product vision, for a product vision that's moving away from just the data collection aspect of things to a more integrated value chain prospect. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, going back to Digital Globe, it was a seminal company in the industry, really created the industry in a lot of ways, at least the American version of the industry. And I don't know that the product vision is fundamentally different. You know, I, I actually, when I think through business history, the moment that I keep focusing on is that moment in sort of 1997 when uh, Apple brought Steve Jobs back on. And when you look at what they did sort of 1997 through 2007, iPod, iMac, culminating in the iPhone, you know, it's not that different from a product vision perspective from what they were trying to do in the early 90s, late 80s with the Newton, right? And I think in a lot of cases, the product vision has to meet the moment of the capabilities of the technology. And sometimes you have a product vision that's really ambitious, but can't actually be manifested with the current generation of technology. And so 
for me, a lot of the work on geospatial insights, geospatial analytics that's been done over the last 15 years, you know, it just was premature. It didn't quite meet the market and it didn't quite meet the need, but the product vision has been there inside of Maxar, inside of Digital Globe, across the industry for a long time. I think what's changing is really the technical maturity of these AI systems, as well as the mass on orbit and the amount of capacity that we actually have now to perform these kind of analytics. That, that's a fair comment, right? And, and, and technology has changed so rapidly over the course of the last decade compared to where we were. And big data is, is a good term because in, in a lot of senses, the satellite imagery industry was one of the first big data sectors, if you think about it. We produced a ton of data. Nobody really thought to label it as such. And now when you look at AI and what you can do with world models, what you can do with LLMs, it's much, much easier to realize what probably was a product vision for decades now. So talk to us about TensorGlobe. What is that all about? And I know that's a big announcement that came along with the branding and it kind of got lost a bit with the name change. Yeah, you know, you can only change so much at one time, but TensorGlobe is really the work I've been focused on since I joined Maxar. And it's an amalgamation of a bunch of different pieces of technology that we've used internal to the company for many, many years and actually provided through a number of different government programs, whether it's GEGD or One World Terrain to the US government, to some allied governments. But we'd always thought about it sort of from a programmatic perspective or from an operational perspective. So what TensorGlobe is, is it's taking a lot of that technology that we've used at Maxar to run our business, to run our tasking, collection management, production, distribution of, of content, and pulling that into a platform that allows other organizations to basically get Vantor in a box, right? So that's sort of the vision of TensorGlobe. And from a naming perspective, we really think about this as the evolution of the digital globe, right? Where if you think about the digital globe vision, that was really focused on taking the physical world and making it accessible to users through a computer screen, through a mobile device, through a tablet, right? So that you could see the physical world digitally. And, you know, as we were thinking about the right name and the right way to communicate the product vision, uh, TensorGlobe really stuck out because it was really focused on taking that digital globe and making it accessible to AI systems, right? Systems that speak natively in tensors, right? These hyperdimensional matrix data structures. And so when we thought about naming the platform, we sort of wanted it to communicate really clearly that the vision was to provide a digital representation of the physical earth that was accessible both to AI systems and to human users. That's a very clever product name, by the way. And I like the fact that it's kind of moving away from, let's say, just focusing on human-centric design and human-centric product development and insights to what is going to become more and more important as we move into this AI era. So is this perhaps also a starting point for you to look at not just at integrating data from your own legion of satellites, but potentially other sensors and other satellite providers as well? If so, how does that vision look like? Yeah, I mean, I think the core vision of TensorGlobe is one of interoperability, where we're thinking about what Vantor is providing really as a scaffolding, a global scaffolding to build on top of. And I like to think about that as sort of providing a consumer grade base map for the enterprise and really being able to use the collection from our satellites to ground and improve the accuracy, the quality, the resolution, the interpretability of data from other satellites. So we've been doing this formally with commercial partnerships with Umbra, with Satellogic, maybe for two years now. And as part of a number of US government programs, we also work with basically the entire geospatial industry to help data from multiple different providers get fused together and distributed to end users. So the GEGD program does distribution work for basically all of the 
commercial data that the US government procures through a single data portal. And that's really focused on that sort of dissemination of data from multiple sources. What I'm much more excited about with TensorFlow is sort of building on work we've done in the One World Terrain program, actually focusing on processing all that data into a unified sort of living globe where each pixel that's coming in, whether it's through a full motion video feed from the ground, aerial assets, space-based systems, SAR systems, right? You can sort of think about each of those as repainting the globe. And the hope with TensorGlobe is that th this becomes really a shelling point or a gravity well, so that to your point about big data, all of the data in the world isn't very useful if you don't know where to go to find it, to look at it, to access it. And so, you know, I think one of the key product visions for TensorGlobe is we want to you know, simplify the analyst's experience so that they're really going to one place and all of the data is there, not just sort of in a raw format, but in a process format, right? In 2D, in 3D, in vectors, spatially aligned, temporally lined up so that regardless of where data is coming from, which source it's coming from, they can apply the same analytic capabilities to sort of a normalized representation of the digital world. On, on one side, it feels like it's a natural evolution. On the other side, it also feels like you are thinking much beyond satellite imagery as well, right? Because when you talk about different sensors, it's easy to imagine this being critical for situational awareness. Geopolitics and security needs have evolved around the world. And now when you think about it, you're no longer relying just on satellite imagery for actual input, but perhaps also from other sensors that are on the ground, that are in your buildings, that are built into other systems as well. Is that a natural progression for Venter? Are you thinking about how do I provide situational awareness, regardless of what sensor this information comes in, as long as there is a spatial aspect to it? Yeah, I think that's a good way of thinking about it. And when I think about you know big problems we're facing in the world, with the advent of AI, the fracturing of the information ecosystem is one that is really top of mind, not just in the context of, you know, consumer experiences, which I think it's, it's quite challenging there, but really in any sort of large scale response to an event, the world has become so fractured from a data perspective. You have social media feeds, you have raw data beaconing from all sorts of pieces of telemetry. You know, every single device is now producing huge volumes of data, but the world is still the same world, right? The world hasn't gotten dramatically bigger. There may be more buildings, there may be more vehicles, there may be more machines, but really it's the same three-dimensional earth that it was 10,000 years ago, give or take. And you know, we think about our opportunity is really taking this exponentially growing amount of data and grounding it into a representation that isn't growing exponentially, right? That, that might get richer, might get higher fidelity, might, you know, provide better user experiences on top of it. But at a fundamental level, you know, we're compressing that data down into a representation that's really logical. Right. Um, rather than having to deal with files and with file systems and, you know, with the sort of meat and potatoes of moving data through a processing pipeline, you know, our, our vision and our theory is that all of that data should just be accessible through an interface that's reading from this normalized representation where you don't really care where the data came from. And I think this is something the industry got wrong. You know, I think we've always thought of ourselves as part of the satellite industries, part of the sort of like space-based intelligence industry. Mm. But when you talk to customers, I mean, whether it's commercial customers or government customers, they're well aware that they're combining this, they're mixing and matching this data. They're doing a huge amount of processing, not just of satellite data in a silo, but combining it with signals from electronic intelligence, signals intelligence, actual ground-based systems, um, lots of data is often coming together. And I think we've relegated ourselves to a corner by not really engaging with the reality that most complex analytic systems are multi-source at this point. So I guess it's, it's kind of a natural evolution moving away from 
let's say, well-intentioned silos where you have one sensor, one data set, one analytic input, then then goes into another system that potentially combines and makes more use out of it into this interconnected, interdisciplinary sensor data set that can process and provide insights, regardless of whether the sensor is on the ground or in space or underwater. Yeah, and I think you, you see this in sort of the evolution of the AI model architectures towards, you know, these remote sensing foundation models generally where the current approach state of the art, you know, maybe going back 10 years would be, you have to train a specialized model on each source of data because the model is really becoming hypersensitized to particular aspects of the data that it's being trained on, the labels it's being trained on. Whereas a lot of the, the more modern approaches are generating these foundation models, many of which actually have bring to bear a ton of textual information, a ton of street view information from the ground level, combining that with aerial, combining that with satellite, and generating a foundation model that you know wasn't actually trained to do any particular task, but is designed to be um, fine-tuned into task-specific models, but to have a general purpose understanding of really the world, right? When you hear people talk about world models, you know, that's one variant of a world model. Sounds like exciting times. I mean, world models and foundation models are definitely the next step in AI. I mean, there is more or less a lot of literature out there that says LLMs have reached the limit of what they can do, and now it's time to invest more energy into world models. So I think with TensorGlobe, you're doing just that. Yeah, I, that, that, that's certainly the vision. And I think that's what we're really focused on. The key aspect from our perspective is, you know, trying not to fight reality, right? A, a, a drone system is always going to have higher currency, generally going to have higher resolution than a space-based system. But the, the goal with TensorGlobe is really to shift from this sort of competitive world where you're trying to say, oh, are we doing aerial or are we doing satellite to say, oh, we're doing both, right? To shift from like an or to an and where you're combining these things together. And then I think, you know, really designing it to feed to AI models is a core part of that vision so that, you know, we're providing a consistent scaffolding globally and then models can, you know, see the latest data on, layered on top, um, linked up. And, you know, we sort of internally often talk about putting every pixel in its place. But, you know, there are definitely pictures that are not spatial, but most images, most JPEGs, most pictures people are sharing, there's a spatial element in it, right? Each of those pixels represents a real piece of space on the Earth. And you know, even in a situation, a disaster response situation, you know, going back to the LA fires last year, you, you have this huge influx of social media data that you want to combine with the space-based data, right? So that you can see all of the different perspectives of what's actually happening over time and, you know, move from that world where you're really looking at a single image, you know, potentially to a world where you're looking at many, many images, many frames that are ultimately compositing together into some sort of video. It sounds like a very interesting product vision. And I, and I think that's, that's really the future, or if not, that's the reality of where we are today. Peter, I think we can talk about this uh, <laughs> potentially for the next Probably, hour. Probably, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do know that you, you have a hard deadline as well, but this has been interesting. Thanks for taking the time and thanks for walking us through um, the Maxar rebranding into Vantor and TensorGlobe and what it means for the product vision and what you're working on. Are there any last comments that you want to share with the audience before we jump off? No, I mean, this has been great. Really, really fun talking to you about it and, and sharing sort of some of the, how the sausage is made and how we're thinking about it. So really appreciate the opportunity and thanks so much for the great questions. Thank you for taking the time. And like I said, you know, Digital Globe and Maxar have been iconic companies and we wish you the very best. And it's going to be interesting to see what your product team is up to. That's the hope. Thank you so much.